Welcome back to this video looking at exploratory factor analysis. So what is exploratory factor analysis, otherwise known as EFA? Basically the purpose of it is to reduce a larger set of questions into a number of factors or sub-dimensions. So imagine me getting all the students' grades for a particular class based on all their assessments and then using an EFA or exploratory factor analysis to break them down into different factors these factors based upon the data might be excellent students, moderate achievers, borderline passers, and perhaps apathetic failures. So we start with a large bunch of data and we reduce it down into different dimensions based upon the, the way in which that data falls. So why do we do it? We do this as usually we, or often we have sub-dimensions nested within an overarching dimension or a construct. So in this data set, we're gonna look at PP, which relates to uh, pet pamperers. And we've got nine items that we've used to measure pet pamperers. So we're going to try and see if there are any sub-dimensions within those nine um, items. As an example, from my PhD, a component of this involved discerning between the different types of emotions that consumers experience when they're exposed to an innovation. So I started with about 60 emotions and then used exploratory factor analysis to reduce it down to a preliminary amount of about 30 spread across six factors of different emotions that all related to each other. So the idea is within each factor, there's emotions that are similar to each other, but they're distinct from the emotions of the other factors. So in that way, they're subdimensions of the overarching um, broader construct. So we can then use these factors or, or sub-dimensions as part of regression analysis or, or uh, calculate means, use them as grouping variables or do a range of things with them. So how do we do it? To do this, we firstly select analyze as we do with all of our stuff, dimension reduction towards the bottom and then factor. Just give me a chance to adjust the screen a little bit. We then move move over the variables that we want to conduct the EFA on into the window. So I've got PP1, select PP9. So I'm now analyzing these nine pet pamper items. We then select rotation and I'm selecting direct oblomen. So direct oblomen is an oblique rotation that's used because it's likely that the nine items we've looked at, that all all relate to each other. So in other words, they're nine items that are measuring a similar thing that being the phenomenon of being a pet pamperer. Um, if we were using items that didn't relate to each other, for example, we've got a whole bunch of items including age, income, purchase history, etc., where each of those isn't specifically related to each other, we would then use an orthogonalized rotation and the most commonly one used for that is what we call Verimax. But because all those items are related to each other, we're going to use um, direct oblomen. Continue. We're then going to hit OK and run the analysis. So the first output we want to view is the uh, the total variance explained, the one we have here. And what we can see here is we've got initial Egan values. So it's telling us there's nine different factors that have emerged or principal components, um, each with different Egan values. So we want to explain as much variance in the data as possible, but only through a number of factors that make sense. If we have too many factors, then it's not going to make sense, or we're going to be reducing them down so narrow that it won't make any sense. So we could create nine factors here. Now we've got nine items, so that would basically be one item in each of those factors, which would perfectly explain the variance in the data as you would expect. It's about finding that middle point or that nice balancing point where there's not too many factors, but also that there's a large amount of variance in the data explained. The way we usually determine that is if the factors, the Egan value of that factor is above one. So we can see here that we've got three factors, one, two, and three, that have Egan values above one, and together they explain 71% or 71.04% of the variance in the data. So this is a good thing. Again, if we included the fourth factor, we'd need to get the, um, we've told the computer to only include factors that have Egan values greater than one, but if we turn that off, we would get a little bit more variance explained in the data, 7.76 more, but would actually be at the cost of the, um, the strength of each of those factors. So we're gonna move down to the pattern matrix. And as we can see here, this is a bit messy. We've got items one to nine, all with these three factors or components, one, two, and three. Now, because we're using direct oblomen, we use pattern matrix. If we were doing the more common Verimax, again, doesn't suit this analysis, but then we would look at the structure matrix, I think it's called. 
So looking at this shows our key results with the number of factors extracted expressed through the number of columns, three factors, three columns, um, and the items that belong to each of those factors. But looking at this, this is a mess. It's very hard to tell what's going on here. Um, it's virtually illegible. So we need to make this output easier to read. So what I should have done in the first place, and what I'll do again now by analyze dimension reduction factor, so just back to the same approach, is options sorted by size, and then we're going to suppress small coefficients. So we only want to show those coefficients that are greater than 0 0.30. We'll then run it again. Same results in terms of all of that, but now our pattern matrix looks very different. That compared to that. So the results are the same, but just the way in which it's showing us um, and the order of those items. So what we did first was we um, sorted them based upon the factors. So we can now see that rather than being one to nine, it's in the order of the factors. So factor one, the items in it are seven, five, and two. Factor two, eight, six, and four. Factor three, three, one, and nine. And it's also suppressed or not shown any factor, um, any associations that are great uh, that are less than 0 0.30 and as a result we can see three very clear factors have emerged here so we can see that the items within a factor in other words these three or these three or these three are strongly associated with each other but show almost no association or in this case we can't see any association with the ones outside of the factor which would be if they had another association at a, at a different point Ooh. Um, so this is because we'd suppressed anyone's below 0 0.30. So we could turn this off or not put it on as we saw before, and there would be a bunch of different ones here, but also because we've sorted these based upon then their ones they relate to, they're all chunked together there. But the general rule of thumb is that you don't want an item to have an association of at least twice the size of its largest association with an item of another factor. And on top of that, we want all of our associations within factors to be about at least 0 0.600. So we can see that here. These are sorted via biggest to smallest. So the smallest for this factor is 0 0.8, 0 0.822, 0 0.71. They're all greater than 0.6, good. And none of them have any factor um, associations in other factors that are greater than 0 0.3. Um, and we can tell that because we've suppressed any that are smaller than 0.3. So if there was any greater than 0.3, we'd be able to see them here. So here we have a very clear EFA with three factors, each with three items in it. So that's the first part. So what we can see is that these items reveal three sub-dimensions, but it's up to the researcher to interpret what those sub-dimensions are. And we do that by closely reading the items. So I can make sacrifices to pamper my pets. My spare money goes towards my pets. I can afford to spend money. So we can see how those three items relate to each other conceptually in the same way that these three relate to each other and these three. But importantly, the items within this one are different to the ones that they all relate to pet pampering, but they're a different sort of pet pampering to the other ones. So we can actually then label these factors or give them a name, at least conceptually and arbitrarily. Um, I've, for example, called pet pamper factor one, spare resources for their pet, and maybe pet pampering factor three is that you're a crazy pet person. So what's important though is we we let the, the concept of the items and theory dictate what we're doing here. So the numbers have come out based upon the EFA, but sometimes they happen a little bit strangely or that they just are purely statistical things that have come together rather than actually things that make conceptual or theoretical sense. So we always need to find that balance between the two. So if we were in a situation where there was some cross loadings, as in ones and other factors that are very high, or there's uh, perhaps items within a factor that don't relate to the others, we've got a problem. We'd need to run it again, but perhaps remove those items from that. So all we would do in that case would be go, okay, that's our starting point with those nine items. Now, for example, Pet Pamper 7 didn't make sense or it was a spurious uh, association. We remove it and then run it again. And we'd find that those associations actually change in that case. So it's really important that we do that. And with EFA, this is an iterative process. We need to, this one's come out clean because that's sort of how I set the data up, but generally it doesn't come out clean first time around. And as I mentioned with my PhD, we started with 60 items and then used it to reduce it down to 30, approximately 30 based upon theory and the results that were there. So it is exploratory. There's no fixed way of doing it, um, but we do need to sort of find that balance between theory and of data. So later on, we're going to look at how we can then use these constructs that we've created by creating new variables based upon them and do some mean analysis, perhaps a regression.